Hello, Sophia. Good morning. And Brandon, let me know if you want me to jump in. Yeah, I we're right at 11, so I'll go on and get started. So first off, hello, thank you. Hello, everyone, and welcome to our course mapping with AR AI webinar. My name is Brandon Gaynor, and I'm the Acting Director of Professional Development with CVC and At One, and I'm pleased to introduce you to our wonderful facilitator, Laura Otero. So I'll give you a little bit of background on Laura, but she can obviously speak or for herself on that one. But while she's currently at CSUMB, she's homegrown at one of our own community colleges at Hartnell, where I believe she worked as an instructional technologist. But since moving towards CSUMB, she has become one of the people at the forefront of teaching about AI and even designed a system-wide course for CSUMB about AI. Laura, I don't know if you want to add in anything extra about your background before I just cover some other logistics. Yeah, sure. Um, you know what? I'll let you cover the logistics and then I'll go into my <laughs> right. own details. For sure. So just a few notes, people. First off, we will be linking to a survey for you to provide feedback. We'll start dropping the link in chat after about 30 minutes and then roughly every 15 minutes after that. We ask that you fill this out to not only let us know how we did, but so that we can continue to create programming that's more tailored to the needs of the system moving forward. Our team does review all the survey feedback thoroughly. So if you really like the webinar and want to see more of it, that helps us so that we can either develop additional content or even bring the same webinar facilitator back. Also, while At One does offer badges as proof of completion for our facilitated courses, we don't offer a badge for attending this webinar. However, if your institution does require proof of attendance for flex credit or professional advancement, please remain to the end of the webinar complete the survey, and request a copy of your responses to be sent through the Google form. For many schools, that's enough to serve as proof of the webinar, and you can use that as proof of your attendance. However, if you need something a little more than that, please email support at cbc.edu. We'll drop that email in the chat shortly and at the end of the webinar. And lastly, we do often get quite a few questions at the beginning and throughout the webinar of when a copy of the recording will be available as well as the slides. We generally try to have them open up on our website within a week of the webinar. Please just give us a little bit of time because obviously we want to make sure that our webinars are accessible and properly captioned and that we have all the appropriate slides up there. Without further ado, I'll turn it over to Laura. Thank you, Brandon. Um, hello, everybody. I'm so excited for you to be here today. Um, I think this will be a fun session. Um, this is not going to be introductory about AI, but we will go into how we can use different tools to support our course mapping processes. Um, so to give you a little bit of background on myself, um, so my name is Laura Otero. Um, I'm the online education coordinator in the Center for Academic Technologies at Cal State Monterey Bay. Um, as Brandon mentioned, I was homegrown. I spent eight years in the community college system as the instructional technologist. Um, which was great fun. Um, I, I feel like I left my heart in the community college system, but I am really enjoying being in the university system as well. Um, so I also teach here. Um, I teach in the instructional science and technology program. Um, I teach graduate students how to be instructional designers. Um, I'm also a certified quality matters master reviewer. So we're going to be covering a little bit about um, course design as well. And so that's some of my background there. Um, and I share with you, so not only my faculty development professional, but I also share here on the screen that I'm a sci-fi author and that is relevant. And it's relevant because um, AI took the writing and the art world by storm. It was something that was very, very threatening to so many of us who create, um, create writing, create art. Um, but I did adopt this fairly early in limited context. So one of the things that I want to incorporate in all of the trainings that I do about AI is that I'm, I'm in some ways I'm pro AI, in some ways I'm very cautiously optimistic about it because I know that this can be a powerful tool, but it's also something that we want to be really careful in our approach and, and use of these tools. So. We'll, we'll talk about those kinds of things a little bit more as we go along. 
Um, but that's my background. And today we're going to be talking about mostly backward design principles. We're going to talk about the practices and the processes involved with course mapping, um, what that means and how we can streamline those processes ethically by using a variety of AI tools. So we'll actually get some hands-on practice in this session as well as looking at some examples and, um, and so on. So um, let's jump in with the concept of backward design. So there's so, so hopefully uh, many of you have some background here in the ideas um, and the learning theories behind this. Um, but basically there are a lot of different ideas and major learning theories that support alignment as a core concept for what makes for good or effective course design. Um, and one of the more foundational frameworks is Bloom's taxonomy. And that's the graphic that you see on the screen. Um, and I'll go into what each of those say in case you have any issues with being able to see it. Um, but to give you some background on Bloom's taxonomy. So in the fifties, we had Benjamin Bloom and a team of educational psychologists who developed a taxonomy of learning objectives. And these built progressively from more simple to higher order thinking skills. And the goal with this research and this work was to address the issue of assessment in the classroom, which focused at the time more on rote memorization, as opposed to more higher order thinking skills, which tend to be more transferable, like out in the real world, right? Um, so Bloom identified six different categories, which were revised based on additional research. And you see the revised the most up-to-date version in front of you now. And you can see that in this graphic, we have six different categories and on the bottom, the foundation. Um, so we start learning first by being able to remember what we're taught. And then we start to build from there. We begin to understand those concepts to the point that we can explain them to others. And then we start to apply the information that we've learned to new situations. Then we analyze by drawing connections between ideas. Then we start to be able to evaluate by using this information to do things like justify our decisions. Um, and then we can produce produce or create new and original work. So knowing this taxonomy, knowing how we build up our learning, this helps us when we're writing learning outcomes because it allows us to scaffold the information meaningfully. Um, and that's really important in being able to retain the information and again, do all those higher order thinking skills. Um, so the next big foundational piece of backward design is John Biggs's work in the 80s on the concept of constructive alignment. And this focuses on aligning the outcomes for our learners, our teaching methods, student activities, and assessments, again, to promote deeper learning. And this is where we can really see some of these ideas take shape. And they're furthered by the work that Wiggins and McTiggy did in 2008. Um, they built on that research about instructional alignment, constructive alignment, by suggesting that learning outcome development by the, the learning outcomes should start the design process, because you need to know your end goal in order to effectively design the rest. So we see these concepts in play in top course design rubrics. There are a variety of course design rubrics. I know in the community college system, we have poker, right? We have the course design rubric. Um, we have in the, in the California State University system, we have what's called the cult rubric. It's actually QLT, but it's pronounced cult. Um, and then nationally, we have the quality matters rubric. And these rubrics, again, promote uh, constructive alignment and backwards design concepts. And this is where we can, um, and this is where course mapping comes into play. And I'll show you what that looks like here on the next screen. But that's kind of our theoretical framework for the things that we're going to talk about today and the tasks that we're going to use AI to fulfill. So course mapping is a practical way that you can design a course or a lesson for alignment. So when you're creating a course map, um, there are many ways that you can do this. Um, how many of you have created a course map before? You can raise your hand if you're on camera, you can put it in the chat, you can just do the hand raise. Okay, good, excellent. So we have some people with experience. Um, 
and everybody else maybe have not done that yet. Um, and that's very normal of you. <laughs> I found that many people don't do course mapping, um, but once they start, it is something that can really improve your instructional improvement process. Like it's, it's a really powerful tool and I'll give you some resources for this as well. Um, but what you see on your screen here is just a screenshot of a very basic sample of how we can design a course map. The idea is that we have different columns here in our spreadsheet, simplest way we can do this, um, where we can place our learning outcomes and then we show how our assessments align with those outcomes, which then goes into the learning activities. So at its most basic, that's really what a course map is. Um, and one note I want to make here is that um, course mapping can be confused with a syllabus, but they really are different things, even if you do have some of these things that show up in your syllabus. Um, course maps tend to be much more detailed in terms of the curriculum itself, whereas a syllabus is going to have a lot of generic information, right, like policies, student support resources, and so on. The course map is really the curriculum at its most basic. Um, so like I said, the, the graphic that you see on your screen shows these things in alignment. Um, and one other thing I want to mention here is we have another learning theory that's kind of rearing its ugly head here, which is the idea, uh, the, the framework of andragogy. Um, so this was Malcolm Knowles' idea, right, or his research, which was, um, and one of the key principles of andragogy is that we support our adult learners in different ways than we support our child learners. So when we're supporting our adult learners, it benefits them, it increases their motivation, it increases their engagement with the material. When they understand the purpose of the activities you're having them do. So by demonstrating in a course map document what those outcomes are. So what are the things that we want our learners to be able to do? We have them student facing, we have them broken down in very simple language, as simple as possible. And then we have our assessments where um, we show how we are measuring our learners ability to meet those outcomes. And then we place those right next to those learning activities, which is how we are supporting our learners in being able to be successful in the assessments, which demonstrate their mastery of those outcomes. So this is something that you may choose to use um, more individually just for yourself to design, to revise, to even uh, uh, analyze your course design. Um, it may be something that you share with your colleagues as you're considering how to build out your curriculum. You know, if you're redesigning some of those program level outcomes, major learning outcomes, things, whatever you have at your institution, or what I've started doing is I share this information. I share this whole course map exactly as it is with my students. Um, and I find that they are looking at it throughout the semester. And that's exciting for me that they're actually internalizing this in a meaningful way. Um, and you can, again, you can include as much information as you'd like here. Um, you may have like on the screen, we see that it says module level learning outcomes. Um, but in the resource that I will share with you shortly, um, you'll see that there may also be a column for course level outcomes. And again, this may be where you have like major learning outcomes and things like this. Um, and if you want to share this with your students, I would encourage you to put things like due dates on it, um, as well as um, uh, so due dates and um, I put like module headers and things like that so students can understand how all this information flows together, how it aligns and how they're going to be supported in meeting those goals. So let me share a template with you and we use this at CSU Monterey Bay. So let me copy the link and put it in here in the chat. And then we'll actually take a look at it as well. Um, and I'll show you what an actual filled out course map looks like um, because I think that that'll be helpful. So this 
course map. If you go to this link, this is going to give you a copyable link. So you just say make a copy like I just clicked on my screen and then this is gonna go, if you have a Google account, it'll go into your Google Drive. I can also distribute this with you afterwards as an Excel spreadsheet, but you'll see I have my, um, I have my important dates, I have my weeks um, and all of this, I can actually update my first date where it says week start. And once I update this with day one of the semester, it's going to update every other week, which is really helpful. So you don't have to like stress about coming out, you know, looking at that map, like, or looking at that calendar, you can just put in the due date and it's going to update everything in this template. Um, and then it goes into the course level outcomes. Those may be institutionally mandated, or it may be that instructors have that freedom. It just depends on your institution. Typically um, at CSU Monterey Bay, we have um, some flexibility with our course level outcomes, but again, it just depends on the, it depends on the department too. And then we have our module level outcomes, our assessments, I have due dates and times because this is student facing. And then learning activity details and I also find that grade points are really helpful. So I use this as um, as a, a tool in many different ways and um, it just helps me organize my course content align my course content and communicate it in a meaningful way to my students and again they're checking it the whole way through so again may be a valuable tool for you um, so we are going to do an activity toward the end of the session where you're going to grab a copy of this and start filling out a little bit of information using ai tools for this but we'll get there when we get there i just want to prepare you for that um, so this is this is a tool that I find incredibly valuable and hopefully you will as well, and this is an example of an actually filled out course map now this can be cognitively overwhelming sometimes. Um, so be be thoughtful about how you present this to students because you don't want them to be overwhelmed by it. But again, this allows me to really detail out what my curriculum looks like and how it aligns with module level outcomes and course level outcomes. So again, take a look at this. This may be useful for you. Um, this is a course that we're that I'm going to be leading here in the Instructional Science and Technology program on AI um, this summer. So this is just an example of what this might look like in practice. And now I want to go into, let me go back into our, oh, I'll just show you the draft right now. <laughs> It's just easier. Um, so we can use different AI tools to support our course design process in different ways. So we'll start with learning outcomes, then we'll go into assessment tools and then instructional material tools. So the first thing I wanna show you is Claude. How many of you have used Claude before? You can raise your hand either physically or you can raise your hand in the um, using the Zoom function. Yeah, Brandon, I see you've used it. Corinne, you've used it. Okay, cool. Claude is my favorite thing. Okay, um, this is very similar. It's a it's a text generative. It's a generative AI text tool, right? Where it primarily generates text, um, but I find it incredibly powerful. I also really like it for. Um, it's just, and this may sound silly, but it matters to me. It's very, very friendly. It's very approachable. Like I want my AI tool to smile to me virtually, right? Like I want it to be kind and I, I like that a lot. So it's just one of those tools that I think is really, really neat. And I'll show you what this looks like. Um, when we develop learning outcomes with Claude, it is a very, very, very effective tool. And we also have Brainstorm. And actually I'm gonna show you Brainstorm first and then I'll show you Claude because I'll tell you why in a second. <laughs> so when we use this brainstorm tool, this is teaching.tools slash brainstorm, and I will put this in the chat. I just think this is such a freaking cool tool. Um, so what it does is we'll go, we'll do a, a learning outcome generation, and I'll go ahead and sign with my Google. You do have to sign into this, but you do, this is free right now. And one thing that I'll say about all the tools that we have at our disposal, many of them are free either on a limited basis or on a temporary basis. So 
this is going to come back into play when I go back to Claude in a second here. But let me just show you what this thing can do because it's powerful. So I'm going to click on learning objectives. Does anyone have a course that they'd like me to generate some learning outcomes for? You can put something in the chat. You can take yourself off mute, but you can just give a little bit of description as to what this course is about and maybe say if it's fully online, if it's, you know, face-to-face, uh, -face, because that's helpful context. So again, anyone can put it in the chat or you can take yourself off mute and jump in with a course. And I'll just take the first one that pops up. I, I, hi, this is Sonali Marina. Um, I am from Glendale Community College, and I am actually great. developing a brand new program called Healthcare Navigator, and I have a brand new course that I am developing. Um, it's in the, it's about 40 percent done and about sixty percent more to go. And I would love your feedback, and it, it will yes. be offered yes. completely online. Okay, and we are great. Very so successful. Right. <laughs> cool. And what was the course title again? It's called Healthcare Introduction to Healthcare Navigation introduction to healthcare navigation and let's say fully online and see what happens yeah. and i'm okay. just going to click and do you have a particular lesson topic and we don't have to put one in but the more we sure. give it the sure. better yes, it's I going do. To. yes i do um it's the first one is actually principles of healthcare navigation or healthcare Great. navigator Great. Mm -hmm. healthcare navigation navigator navigation um, navigator, uh, because the overarching course is navigation. So the specific chapter one will be navigator. Okay, great. So you see what I have put in here and I'm just going to click next and see what it comes up with. Now it does take a minute to do this, but this is where we can also start putting in some of the um, learning outcomes if you would like, if you already have these developed. But here's what I love about this tool. So you remember what we talked about with Bloom's Taxonomy, we had remembering, understanding, applying, analyzing, and you see that here, right? Yes. So we have several different learning outcomes that are provided at each level of Bloom's Taxonomy. Um, mm -hmm. So what it, do you see any that would work for your course or maybe that uh, appeal to you about this? Anything similar to what you've um, created? Or is it I like the, the recommended. One of my biggest challenges right now is making the course very diversified, addressing mm. DEIA needs. So that, that's a major component because I am not requesting anybody to have a, a level of English. So I am trying to go with the most basic. Um, maybe recommended is always a good option instead of required. So I, I'm using that. Um, taxonomy recommended right now. It also gives the student an idea that we are not pushing them into a corner. So we are recommending them something. I like that. Mm, got it. Cool. So you can see that this gives you a lot of different options and whether you actually use this or just use it to um, or if you just use it as kind of a starting point, as a springboard for some of your ideas, this is a very useful tool for this. Um, so I like this a lot. You can also click on more ideas or regenerate if you're just not meeting the mark. And you can go back and you can do what we call prompt engineering, where you start to refine what you're asking for based on what what you're seeing so like if you see these outcomes and you're like you know these just aren't quite it this helps us to then refine what we're asking for because sometimes it's in the way that we're asking the questions um so this is really really a very useful tool but the other thing that i want to point out about this and we saw that there are a lot of different functions about this tool so again you can get to this tool in the um in the chat there's a link in the chat um and this is great. I like Cynthia, you've provided another one as well. And this is really helpful. And so you can give as much information as is appropriate to the tool. Um, now, I prefer to keep my subscriptions limited. OK, you will find that the more you get into working with these different AI tools, the more it's going to cost eventually. OK, so I think it's it's reasonable to kind of identify like one text generator that you want to subscribe to, maybe your institution, if not yet, 
eventually, hopefully we'll have some kind of um, subscription for you. I think that's the way that we're going broadly. I know these are some of the conversations we're having in the state university system is, you know, how can we support our faculty by giving them access to these tools? And yeah, I can, I can absolutely add that link again. Anna, let me put that back in here. That way it's not lost. Um, and this will also be on the slides that will be shared with you at the end of the presentation too, just so that you all know. So don't panic if, if you miss one of the, one of the links. Um, so anyway, I like to keep my subscriptions limited. So I see a tool like this and um, what I think is, okay, I love this. And what do I love about it? Well, I love that it's really explicit in terms of how each of these outcomes are provided that show the alignment to which to each level of Bloom's taxonomy, because it enables me to make more informed decisions. It enables me to do things like scaffolding and things like that as I design my curriculum. So I'm going to then go into something like Claude, because that's the tool that I pay for. That is um, an equivalent to ChatGPT. Many folks in the industry are saying that Claude is more powerful than ChatGPT, and I think it depends who you ask. This is the tool that I use and I use these tools fairly extensively. Um, so here I am in Claude. And so I'm gonna read this out loud to you if you have trouble seeing this because you have a small screen. Um, but what I've done here is I've entered a prompt and this is for a totally different course, but it gives you the idea. So I'm entering in my prompt language into the chat and I just asked it if it could suggest, you know, could you suggest learning outcomes for each level of Bloom's taxonomy for an introductory psychology course on learning. Now, I didn't specify my um, I didn't specify mo my modality. That's something that you may find useful as you as you work with this kind of stuff more. But this is just to give you kind of a, a brief introduction to this. So you'll see how it's it's always very friendly. Certainly, it says with an exclamation mark. Claude is very friendly, um, and it gives you those learning outcomes. And then, if you can see this, it says "remember," and then it shows knowledge right behind it. So these are actually the new, the revised Bloom's taxonomy language right here is "remember," whereas the original Bloom's taxonomy was "knowledge." Um, so that's kind of a neat feature that it does, and it just gives me several different learning outcomes. And what excites me about this, and we're not gonna do an in-depth lesson on writing measurable learning outcomes, but the short version is that you want to use verbs when you're writing these learning outcomes, you wanna write verbs or use verbs that are easy to measure. So you'll see here with the remember outcomes, it says we're gonna have our learners define key terms, blah, 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 it gets really specific. We want them to be able to list and describe. We want them to be able to recall. These are all verbs that I can assess. I can test these and make sure that they do them, right? And maybe with something, um, when we're doing kind of those lower order Bloom's taxonomy things, maybe a uh, multiple choice quiz is the easiest way that we can assess whether our learners can define, whether they can list, whether they can recall certain you know, these different items. So it goes on and on and it gets more and more advanced until we are creating new content, right? So maybe in this course, if this was like a graduate level course, for instance, we want them to design an original experiment, right? Like that's again, how we build from the, the more basic kind of rote memorization stuff and we build until our learners can create and synthesize that new content. So I find Claude to be incredibly powerful. Um, I have had more um, learning outcomes that I don't love from that teaching tools, the brainstorm tool that I shared with you. Um, so I, I talked about measure, being able to measure these things. One example of a, of a learning outcome or a verb that would be harder to measure would be, um, would be something like understand, right? So if instead of define key terms, we had it had written understand key terms, 
that's harder for me to measure than my, you know, my ability to measure whether they can define it successfully or not, if that makes sense. Um, again, we're not going to go super into depth about that, but that's kind of the, the basics of, of writing learning outcomes. So I find this to be an incredibly valuable and powerful tool, because even if it shows me things that are not quite it, I can refine that prompt to be more specific. So maybe in the at the next one, when I if I if I just hated all this, if I thought this was all garbage, which half of the time when I'm using AI tools, I'm like, okay, that one's garbage. Let's go to the next one. Um, you can refine that prompt and you can say, okay, maybe include more, um, ha look through a lens of diversity, equity, and inclusion, right? Um, I'm thinking about the question that you asked about yes. Um, yes, thank the you. last one. Yeah, so that would be a way that you can start you know, shifting that lens that this tool is looking through. And again, you're just getting ideas. Um, so I find it to be valuable for creating learning outcomes because it's a fairly straightforward thing. Um, and the more information you feed into this tool, the better it's going to be. So if you feed in, again, information about modality, um, you could even feed in information about, you know, your institution. You could say, here's my institutional mission and vision. Here's the program. Um, and here's the program learning outcomes. Could you design learning outcomes that are maybe course level or module level for a 16 week course, you know, that fits within this broader program. So, um, so yeah, there's, there's a lot of different options that you have. And let me give you, um, Stephanie asked in the chat, if I can provide the link to Claude and here it is. Thank you for asking that question. Um, again, love Claude. You do have to use your phone number to sign up. Um, so something to think about again, this is one that I use that I absolutely love. And I think it's very powerful. Um, and this kind of goes to our next item. Uh, I see you thumb, thumbs up, Eric. <laughs> Good. I'm, I'm glad it's useful. Um, so the next thing that you can do, and I'm just going to scroll down here in the chat a little bit, is now we can start thinking about our assessments, right? Because when we do that backward design process, we're starting with our learning outcomes, and then we are going to do assessments as well. So right here, I just asked, um, could you suggest assessments for an online course for each of those outcomes? See, this is where I'm actually um, identifying the, the modality. Totally up to you. It may not be valuable. Maybe it is, but I'm putting that prompt language in here just so you, in the chat, just so you can see it. And you'll see right here, as I suggested, right, like for the remember for that basic, um, I would say foundational tier, you have multiple choice quizzes, testing key terms, definitions, and basic concepts, right? Fill in the blank exercises, matching activities. And then as we move up, right? For apply, we have simulations, interactive exercises, analyze, we have comparison essays, breakdown assignments, data analysis exercises. Um, we have for evaluation, we have debate style discussion forums, and we have more detailed content. So typically what I would recommend you do is if you're, if you're using this tool in this way, I would identify what those learning outcomes are, like those final learning outcomes, because you're probably going to edit them as well and put in your own, you know, kind of unique take or your own lens on the information. Um, and then you would put those in and ask it to suggest um, different assessments. And you may want to put in prompt language, like, could you recommend authentic assessments for this particular tool? Can you recommend um, a way that I can assess my students knowing that they may have access to the internet for this, or knowing that this is an open book quiz or whatever it is? The more information you put in, the better the, the outputs are going to be. So this is just one way that you can use a single tool. There are also assessments that are suggested with the, with the other tool that I shared with you. Um, a lot of these other tools um, tend to be replicable with one single like text generator if you're prompting in a knowledgeable kind of way. So I encourage you to experiment with these tools. Um, and, and I'll talk about this when we actually get to the activity. Um, but just to kind of prepare you for this, it, it is worth 
considering what your comfort level is with all of these different tools because every time we use one of these tools we are either providing training data or we're providing personal data just depending on what information is that we share so we don't want to do things like um one thing that i've seen that i would not recommend doing with these kinds of tools um, is like entering say a student essay in here that would not be an appropriate use necessarily of this tool, because once we put it into this tool, we don't know where it's going. Um, we It's important to look at the privacy policies with each of these tools. And again, this is another reason that I like to keep it kind of limited as far as how many tools I'm using and subscribing to and sharing my data with. Um, so we have talked about different uses for these different tools in the course mapping process. Um, one other thing that I want to share with you is, and this is more of a, a, an assessment kind of tool, maybe a practice activity kind of tool, but I absolutely love this and my students love it too. Um, so this was the first semester I used something called Learning Studio AI. Um, I will put that chat in, or I will put that link into the chat as well. Um, Learning Studio AI is awesome. Um, I use it because what this does is um, it says it creates online courses um, and that's a stretch. <laughs> it creates what I perceive to be uh, what I would classify as micro learnings, um, micro learning activities, and this is how I use it in my courses. Um, and what I do for this is, you know, we focused on um, course mapping and making sure that all of our content is aligned. Um, so what you can do with this particular tool, and this is limited in terms of um, how free it is, but I show it to you because it's really powerful. Um, but what I do here is in the subject, you could say, you know, introductory psychology. And that's going to be a very broad prompt that is probably not going to get you what you need. What I do instead is I enter in either the exact learning outcomes that I'm trying to meet with this activity, or I will put in some kind of, you know, there's like a, there's a character limit. So I'll put in kind of like shortened language. So in this particular one, I want to use this in my AI course that I'm gonna be teaching this summer through the um, Instructional Science and Technology grad program. So I want to, I, so I shorten this language. I am putting in describe what generative AI is and how AI can be used ethically in higher education. So that's my prompt and I'm going to click on create course and it's going to take a minute. Um, but what this produces, and I'll actually show you while it's generating, because it takes like a minute, I'll show you one that I created for a totally different subject. So this is about, um, these are like some light neuroscience that it, that's in this program, um, talking about different learning theories, like cognitive flexibility is a theory and inclusivity, universal design for learning, things like that. And so this is the output file that Learning Studio AI has generated that I have heavily edited. And then I'll show you an unedited version in just a second. But what this does is it creates an interactive micro learning where it's going to give you an overview of these different topics. So it's kind of like a Wikipedia article almost, right? And that it's very basic information. It's pretty simple. It talks about these different um, learning theories and things like that. And then it gives you just a brief summary kind of wrap up. I use my institutional colors so that way it looks on brand, right? And then it includes some embedded quiz questions. And here's where this tool becomes very powerful. Um, you can take this file and it uses proper heading structure and things like this which is very nice in terms of accessibility um, although there are some color contrast issues like right here where it says question one out of five that's a color contrast issue but those are things you can fix in the file so it's something to keep in mind if you actually intend to use this for your courses but what it does is again it kind of gives you a wikipedia style summary of your topic and then it gives you a little embedded quiz and this oh and there was a question no okay um so feel free to put anything into the chat and jump into the questions i'm always open to that um 
but this will give you that basic summary again micro learning kind of content and then and it gives you basically a web page but then you can actually embed it into a canvas course and then this will populate the gradebook this is called a SCORM file um so i don't know how many of you are familiar with that i see my id shaking their heads yep yep <laughs> these are great micro learning activities that give your students instant feedback it's i do really low stakes kind of stuff here like very low point values things like that because it's something that just boosts their ability to retain the information that i covered in the lecture and in the different readings um, but it's it's just kind of a an easy thing for me to put into my courses that add in that element that's just it looks a little bit nicer right than a than a wall of text um, and it's just it's something that my students have given me feedback they absolutely love this actually surprised me i was kind of afraid when i put this in there that they were not going to love this or that they were going to um, react negatively because i put in there um, i describe that this is an ai tools. So I say, you know, this is something that I created with AI, but I have heavily edited this, this item. Um, so I share that information with them. That's important in being ethical users of this kind of stuff is that we share where we were transparent about our use of these tools, because then we're modeling the behavior that we expect to see from our learners. So that's really important. Um, so I was afraid that they were going to react negatively to this um, and say, oh, well, you know, this person, you know, just generated this and didn't spend a lot of time, but I do spend a lot of time editing this. Um, and they really love getting that instant feedback again, very low stakes. So there's not a lot of incentive to cheat. It just boosts their grade a little bit and drives home those co those core concepts that we're covering. Um, and yes, I had a question in the chat about, um, can you export the quiz into a Canvas quiz? Yes, exactly. This, this you can export it as a SCORM file and then you import it as as an assignment and then so it's not exactly like a canvas quiz in the sense that canvas quizzes are their own thing but it does import as an assignment that automatically gets graded which is great um, so i like this tool a lot i use it and my students love it so something to think about. Um, and just going back to the one that we created, this is like a boilerplate output file. So you can kind of see already how much editing that I do of these things. Um, because right here, like I, I don't, I do not love this graphic. So I always end up, you know, going in and editing this. I always change the colors so that they're my school colors. I go in, I change the, um, I change the picture so that it's a little bit more meaningful. Usually I edit this language because it will come out with whatever you put in, which are the learning outcomes. So usually I make it shorter, things like that. Um, it also gives you, I mean, this is crazy, right? But it's it's useful. It gives you an introduction. It gives you like um, all these different subheaders. It always gives you the practical applications, practice activities, a wrap up and a quiz. And I almost always cut it down so it's just like an introduction a wrap-up and a quiz because i use this in a very simple way um so it's going to go over all these things right which which are pretty i mean again it gives you kind of this this tool it's really a brainstorming tool that you can go in and edit um i will also share with you that the questions are not great i always go in and heavily 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 edit the questions because they're usually like not excellent when it's just the the ai output but again i love this tool i put it in my courses my students love it it makes life easier any questions about this particular tool is anybody excited about this tool or any others that we've shared thus far okay hopefully there's some excitement there's, uh, you, can, you can upload this quiz right into your Canvas course and it will go into the grades. Yes. So when you upload it as a SCORM file and choose the upload type as an assignment, yes, it'll go right into the grade book and you will be able to edit that to say how many points you want it to be worth or if you want it to go into any particular category or whatever. So yes, absolutely. There's like two or three steps involved, but it's not super difficult. Um, and, and good, I'm glad I see lots of positive uh, items in the chat. I'm glad that you guys are excited about this um, because I think it's powerful. 
Um, one thing that I will share, I had an experience where I was co-teaching a course and, you know, I shared this with my co-instructor and, um, and she's just the loveliest human being, but that's not here nor there. Anyway, <laughs> so I, I was working with this co-teacher and, um, she was really excited about this tool. She used it, um, but she didn't edit the quiz questions. And it, it's the kind of thing that you have to be careful when you're using these tools because if the questions are totally messed up, it's it's a hassle to change, right? Because you have to go back into Learning Studio, you have to re, you know, you have to re-edit the the quiz questions there, and then you have to download it and then re-upload it. It's not as easy as editing like a quiz question that's in Canvas already, um, and it can also damage your credibility. Like if you are asking um, questions that are totally unrelated, it can be really def uh, it could feel very defeating for students where they're like, well, this this doesn't even make sense. Or maybe they feel like you haven't taken the effort to go through. And none of those things are true, right? Like we put a lot of effort into this. So I, I would just encourage you to be very cautious about it um, whenever you're you're using these tools because you are the expert. You are the eyes that need to go over this in the same way that, you know, let's say you have a student assistant in the course, you're not gonna like have them develop a quiz and not look at it twice, right? Um, look at it twice always and make sure that you make those changes as, as early as you can before it, you know, before it can throw off your students. Um, and yes, yeah, Cynthia mentioned I had to make sure the quiz questions related to the module objectives. Absolutely, yes. Um, and Ray asked, can Learning Studio AI export to the QTI format? That's a great question. Um, I have not tried it. I would not try it. And I would not try it only because this is so, um, like SCORM files are very like HTML heavy. So like we're looking at this and effectively this is a web page of information, right? Like that's how it manifests. And so, yes, Eric, love that. Yes, AI will not replace humans. Humans using AI will, yes. Um, so yeah, I wouldn't export this to a QTI format um, just because it's not gonna have any of the benefits, right? Like if you wanna do that, then you could just generate this and like you could copy and paste the six questions that aren't very good. Yeah, I would use something like um, like Claude or ChatGPT or whatever thing is that you use to generate quiz questions, you know, uh, before I used this. Because most likely, I mean, all these things are using like ChatGPT as the API for this, as like the thing, as like the engine for this tool, if you will. Um, so it's, if you don't wanna have this visual display, then you're gonna be better off just using ChatGPT to generate quiz questions as a brainstorming kind of tool. So hopefully that answers that question. Um, so the next thing that I want to share with you, so we talked about some assessment tools, we talked about some learning outcome generation tools. So now let's go into some, um, we'll go into some learning activity tools and I'll just go back to what I mentioned about Claude, where again, if you're putting in those outcomes, you're putting in those assessments, you can really meaningfully brainstorm ideas for learning activities. Um, and with just our basic text generator, I've used this, um, I've used this to even connect more abstract ideas. So, um, like, for example, one of the courses that I teach is um, where students will make measurable progress toward their capstone, which is their master's thesis. So as they're doing that, we're, we're talking about different learning theories, right? And, um, and I want them to be able to identify how they can use a learning theory, whatever learning theory they choose as a lens for their thesis. So when I have them do this, um, I have to like, for me to be able to brainstorm this really effectively, if I'm using AI, I have to feed information into AI about what the capstone requirements are. You know, I have to feed information about the different learning theories, and then I can ask it to suggest learning activities that will build up throughout the 16 weeks of the of the course um, and things like that. So the more information you put in, the better the outputs are going to be. Um, and Cynthia noted, I would ask for a specific number of questions based on the lecture content. And even after editing, I would end up with about what half of I 
half of what I asked for to use in the course, yes, right? There are definitely limitations of using AI with these, with these things. Um, so text generators are great for suggesting learning activities. Um, you can also ask for it to suggest um, current research in the field, right? You could ask for it to um, identify landmark studies, for instance, that you may want to communicate to your student that gives them, you know, more of a theoretical framework. So Again, text generators are great for this, but you can also use something like Canva, not Canvas, Canva. How many of you already use Canva? I see hands, yeah. It makes pretty stuff, right? Yeah, okay, cool. Everybody uses Canva, great. So canva.com, you can get, oh, and Corinne, oh, you probably raised your hand to answer that, but let me know if you have a question. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, Canva is super fun, Eric. Yes, I love it. I use it for so many different things. And um, and it is, you, I'll show you how to get to the AI powered part of Canva because you don't necessarily have to use AI with Canva, but there's a whole section I'm gonna show you how to get there. Um, but you'll see here, here are some examples of things that you can create with Canva. You can create documents, you could create interactive whiteboards, presentations, educational videos, infographics, posters, great stuff for your courses. And yeah, Corinne, I'm so glad that you asked that question. So Corinne asked, has Canva gotten any better in terms of accessibility with its outputs? And the answer is, uh, <laughs> kind of, not really. Uh, so I think, um, so, so accessibility is really going to come down to your knowledge of remediating content, remediating documents, and being really careful with how you use these things and what you use them for and being able to offer um, meaningful equivalence. So yeah, if you do something like say, I'm just looking at the screen, I have info, uh, education infographic here, and then I'll come Candace, back to your, your question, um, but I'm looking right here, education infographic. This might be really engaging for your students who can see, right? Um, for students who may have, I mean, color blindness or other kinds of um, differences, I think you're, you're going to want to provide a remediated version that has alternative text, that has, um, you know, plain text writing. You always want to provide an alternative, but it doesn't mean that you shouldn't use this just because you have to provide an alternative. In fact, you can use, um, and Eric mentioned that it offers alt text tools. Wonderful. Thank you for noting that. Um, so the way that I use this is I, I will use it to create a really pretty thing that is maybe not super accessible, but then I will link a plain text version of it. And this, you know, this kind of comes back to universal design theory for those of you who are familiar with this. Um, I might want to offer an alternative format, not only to meet the needs of those with different abilities, but also um, just because our learners learn differently and some of them prefer to read something that's in plain text. Maybe they're distracted, maybe they hate your design, whatever it is, it's, it's useful for you to offer an alternative either way for all students. Um, but that's all I'll say about uh, universal design theory because I could go on and on about that because it's wonderful. Um, so yeah, just be really thoughtful about the way that you implement and use and integrate these tools. Um, and another thing that I'll share with you is that Claude and other tools as well have, uh, other AI tools have gotten a lot better about generating alternative text. Um, I have been absolutely blown away um, by Claude in terms of its ability to generate meaningful alt text for um for like big graphs like those are always so hard to um to remediate to make available in plain text so it's not relying on visual means to communicate information um but those tools can do it so i think it's a great remediation tool so all is not lost but let me show you and let me get to canvas's question and then i'll show you the different ai tools so Candace asks, what happens to the info you put into the system? Do the EULs insist that the info you provided becomes a part of the content they will use for other people's inquiries? That's a great question. And that really comes down to um, what the privacy policy is. Um, and Michael also asked a question privately. I've never used Canva. Can we, can we give a 20 second overview? Yes, 
let me do that in just a second. Um, but to go back to Candace's question, um, it depends on the tool that you use. If like, so some of the tools absolutely use your information that you put in, your training data, like when you are typing information in, it is training the tool theoretically to be better. So it just depends. And yeah, I agree, Rob. I was just about to say, um, even if they say, according to the privacy policy that they won't, I wouldn't, I would believe it, to be honest with you, just because I, I just, I just don't, I don't believe anybody. But <laughs> I think it's, it's something to think about is like, especially, with, yes, trust no one. I love this. Um, I, I think that it just, it's, it makes too much sense that they would use it. So like common sense dictates <laughs> that they will probably use it. So again, just be thoughtful about your use of these tools. And <laughs> Brandon says trust but verify or don't trust and still verify love this yes these are these are all in line with my personal philosophy. Um, so yeah just be thoughtful about what you put into these tools never put stuff in that is private that you would not be okay with sharing right now for so that kind of brings us back to canva so canva we can create many different types of content and you can click on create a design to create whatever design you want um i use canva so i mentioned that i'm a post-apocalyptic sci-fi writer like nerd alert if you didn't already gather that um but i use this for my book covers because it's very powerful it creates beautiful stuff it's really really wonderful um so you create a design and you can set whatever parameters you can use whatever template you want I could go on and on, but I'm not going to because I want to get to the AI powered apps. So the way that you get to this is you log into Canva, you're going to click on apps in the left menu. So canva.com, I put the link in there, but I'm sure it's like buried canva.com and then click on apps. And then you have a ton of really cool apps. If you want to filter to the AI powered ones, you're going to click on AI powered right here in the middle of the screen. These are both cool and scary. Okay, I'm emotionally preparing you for this um, because there are some very powerful tools and some very frightening ones. Um, so for me, I this is useful for um, so Dolly is integrated. So you have a certain amount of free AI images that you can generate using this tool. Um, there are a host of ethical considerations that we don't have time for today, but just be thoughtful about this because when we're generating AI images, they are using um, other people's images broadly that may or may not have consented to the use of um, the use of their images in training this machine. So again, that's a whole other thing we're not gonna go into today, but just be aware that, that you can create AI images here, which can be very useful for livening up, um, you know, your instructional materials, making your slideshows very pretty, things like that, right? Um, you can also, um, this DID AI presenters one, this one scares me a little, but, I'm interested. Um, so I, I've seen this this tool used, and basically what it does is it creates a talking head for your presentations. So ways, so you want to be really, really thoughtful and cautious about this because in one way, I'll, sh I'll share a use case with you. Let's say you are exhausted. You do not look your best. You are not going to record yourself on camera today. I have had many days like that, okay? But you still need to get content up and running. Um, adding a DID AI presenter can add a very professional, very polished talking person head onto your presentations. Um, you are doing this, however, at the cost of building community and humanizing your course. So you're not humanizing your course when you're using an AI robot talking head. That is my opinion, okay? It may be debatable just to think, just know that. Um, you can also upload an image of yourself and make it look like you are talking. You can upload your voice and things like that. So things to think about, right? Maybe this is useful because you're not gonna get camera ready today and you've gotta get a tutorial video out or whatever it is. Maybe it can, 
uh, inhibit the trust that your students have for you. So just be thoughtful about it. And yeah, Rob, I'm glad that you, oh yeah, Cynthia asked a question as well. <laughs> Rob also said creepy. Yep, can sure be creepy. Something to think about. Um, and yeah, Cynthia, if you use one of the AI powered tools, is there a separate charge for this tool? It depends. Most of these tools, yes. Um, and usually you can get like the free trial version kind of stuff. So it's a good way to experiment with these tools and see which ones are useful for you in your practice. Um, but again, all things to think about, think about ways that you can um, use other tools that are like one single subscription for that kind of thing. Um, yeah, and the AI tools are part of the pro subscription, but limited in terms of how much you use it. Yeah, Rob is absolutely right. Some of them are included, some of them are not. Um, so again, all things to think about. So I use these things sparingly, but I reserve the right <laughs> to get to use a talking head on one of my videos because I am not camera ready that day, right? Just things to think about. Um, there's also video avatars that represent your speech, right? Like this one right here. Again, use them sparingly, use them thoughtfully. Um, disclose your use of these tools. I think that's really the key to this. Um, make sure that your students understand that you're not trying to pass this off as anything that it's not. Um, you are, you know, you're using this tool for this purpose, for this reason, whatever. I think that's a really valuable thing to just demonstrate, um, just demonstrate that integrity. You can use these tools without, you know, feeling like you have to do, the, do so in a sneaky way. Um, Anyway, lots of different tools. There are so many different tools. Um, one thing to think about related, just going back to that like video avatar, um, two, two thoughts on this. One is yes, you are sharing your voice with an AI tool and that can be scary, right? Because now, you know, what, what are you giving away when you're training this to use your voice? On the other hand, if you have a YouTube channel where you're talking for hours and hours, does it already have your voice? Well, maybe, right? So that's that's the kind of stuff to think about is, um, you know, just be practical in, in your approach to this. So lots of different things, lots of different things to think about, um, but these are also some really fun tools. So we are now at the practical portion and I know it's 12. So those of you who have got to go, go live your life. But for those of you who want to hang out, what we'll do, and I know this goes until 1230, but I know you guys got to eat. Um, so I just want to acknowledge that, okay? Um, one thing that we're going to do in this optional activity is I'm going to give you the link again to this spreadsheet. <laughs> um, let me copy this. So this thing that I am linking in the chat here that you can click on that is the copyable course map that i've distributed to you and so what i'll do is i'm going to put everyone into small groups and i want you to get a copy of the course mapping template just grab that copy and then you can prompt any generative AI tool that we shared. Um, we talked about Claude, we talked about ChatGPT. Perplexity is another wonderful one that I would encourage you to explore and check out. It's very um, transparent and you don't have to log into it, which is really useful. Um, and then I would encourage you to go in, prompt these tools to create and or enhance two to three learning outcomes and suggest one aligned assessment for one module in any course and then edit it and add it to your course map. If you do this in small groups, you're going to ex find yourself experimenting with prompt generation and you're going to see what works best for you. And then at the end of this, we're gonna come back together and I'll actually just do, let's do a 10 minute session. And so I had this planned for 30 minutes, but I wanna have you know time for some more in-depth questions. Um, so let's do about 10 minutes where I'm gonna put you in breakout rooms. I want you to copy that course mapping template, prompt this to create or enhance two to three learning outcomes and suggest an aligned assessment for any module in your actual course. And then we'll come back together and we'll share our experience. We'll share our prompts. So keep track of those because we may find something that's incredibly useful. So I think I have the ability to generate breakout rooms. Maybe I do, maybe I don't. Um, it looks like, oh, I do, fabulous. So I am going to 
create how many people do we have here give me okay we've got 23 participants so let's do five breakout rooms with i'll actually do four breakout rooms with four to five participants per room i'm gonna put this prompted to the chat again so that you don't have to remember but you can always take a screenshot of it if you'd like and we're going to come back together after 10 minutes of experimenting with this and just share your experience what worked what didn't what prompts were amazing for you so i'm going to create the breakout rooms and i'll have them close automatically after 10 minutes and then we'll come back together and share. So I will see you in a bit. And I'll stop sharing. They've got, they've got 30 seconds before they come in. So give them a little time. Hello, hello, more people coming back in. Cool, and everybody else should be back. All right. Cool. Well, thank you, everybody, for participating and for sticking around for this, because I think this is a really important activity to do. Um, so I just kind of want to go around the room um and do not feel pressured to share but i would love to have folks share what the process was like now we don't need to share the outputs although you are more than welcome to do so if you would like but i just love to hear from each group um what that was like for you did you find it useful did you find you know what were the prompts that you used so anyone can volunteer to jump in. I uh, yeah, Kevin. I will. Um, so I, I didn't get super far in the process actually, but far enough to uh, I, uh, to to basically have the same kind of um, uh, outcome that you had on the on Claude, and uh, it was mm -hmm. actually pretty good. Uh, the, the the things that I got were actually um, useful. I, I think I need to go over the part about using the um what's the second tool, the uh brainstorming tool. Uh mm -hmm. how, how you use that. I, I'm gonna have to look, I'm gonna have to review that one. But um sure. but you know, went through the Bloom's taxonomy and uh uh you know the course I used is not a advanced course, it's a community college, basically first level of art history course. So sure. <clears throat> we're just trying to get people like into the stream of like how you even think about it. So, but there were good suggestions right out of the right out of the box that I can probably use for um, developing, you know, well, well for building a course map actually. So yeah, excellent. Yeah, and it, you know, it was nice backwards planning since you know it does it it, it emerges from a you know that process, and so that's always. All is good. I mean, there'll probably be some work in getting the assessments to work out, but yeah, that's always, of course, that's where the challenge is, really. So, uh, but I. Oh, I can't tell if I lost audio. Can oh, everybody I... hear him? Oh, nope, there you are. Yeah, sorry. I don't know why. <laughs> sometimes it doesn't work as well as I wish. Anyway. Oh, um, I think we lost you again. <laughs> well, I just have to go through the workflow again, if you can hear that. And uh, that's, oh, yep. I'll, I'll just review the video. I'll, I'll review the recording. Sure. But I'm happy. Cool. With it. Really interesting. Super great. Good. I'm so glad to hear that. Anybody else have any experience that they want to share? We had four people in our group and three of us were like chickens with our heads cut off and going <laughs> what and uh and one person <laughs> had some experience already and had worked with some of the tools and she was very helpful uh we Good. couldn't hear screens so we couldn't really do anything um mm -hmm. and um 
one of the things our discussion came to was that obviously in working with AI, the, how you word the question is the most important thing. Yes. And, and um, for me, the training has been like speed skating past a whole lot of great big signs that I took some notes and I can visit those signs later, but <laughs> I have almost no idea, or just the vaguest idea of, oh, there's some goodies over here, there's some goodies over here, and this is worth exploring. Um, but I'm sure if somebody had worked some with AI, this would have been a much more powerful experience for me. Mm. But, uh, well, it was also extremely powerful for me because at least I know there's goodies out there and I have some addresses to go visit. <laughs> so. Good. Yeah, that's, you, you bring, you raise a great point about just familiarity with AI and comfort level with using these tools. And I think um, we are finding people at all levels right now, um, where some people have already implemented it into their daily workflows and others are brand new to it. And there, there are a lot of resources um, for working with AI for the first time. So you're certainly not alone if it's something that's fairly new. Um, but yeah, the more you get comfortable with these tools, I really appreciated what you said about, um, it's all about the prompt, right? It's all about what you put into the tool and that's going to dictate how good the output is going to be and i think that's absolutely right and really the answer to that is practice um and just getting more familiar with how they work and and having that kind of conversational style with these tools like think about it like what i do is i really think about it like i'm asking a real person on the other line right i'm asking my teaching assistant what they think and that seems to give me pretty good output um, and, and one thing I want to mention, too, about this is that um, we at CSU Monterey Bay are, are working on a prompt library, and a prompt library is just where I'm just doing it really basically in Google Documents, where I have a shared folder that has all these different documents where people can jump around and find different prompts, different ways that they can use different tools. And it gives suggested language for like, here's what you put into the tool and here's where you put your own information and things like that. I think these are going to be increasingly needed um, as AI use becomes more widespread because it really guides those efforts. And that's all the, I'll say about that. One of the <laughs> other things that was, uh, that was thematic for all of us was that you had this, uh, this week at a glance uh, form, and you said this is this is a, a template, but mm -hmm. what's available to us is like a, it's just a photograph. It's static. We can't use that template. Oh. We can't use that uh, form. And everybody mm -hmm. went, "Oh yeah, it'd be great to download that and be able to use it," but you know we would have to recreate it in uh, I don't know. Uh, they have some form in, in my computer, Microsoft Desk, Excel, where I could probably shift that around by copy in yours. But we we can't, you said that's a template, but mm. nobody can download that as a template. I'm so glad that you said that. Um, so what I'm putting in the chat right now is an Excel spreadsheet version of it. So you can do exactly that. And I should have thought to do that before I gave you the link. So I'm so glad you mentioned that, Michael. Um, so I. I honestly, I don't know how the formatting is going to look. <laughs> Just to be honest, you may need to stretch things out and resize a little bit, but it does have the basic information in it. So that way you can open it in Excel and hopefully that will be helpful. Um, the link that I shared was a make a copy, which works if you have a Google document, but not, or if, if you have access to a Google account, but not if you don't. So thank you so much for asking that question. Hopefully um, what I provided in the chat will give you something um, that can be that can be helpful. Um, and I'll also, um, I had a private question about the prompt library and if you all can have access to it. I'm going to go ahead and give you access to that. Um, it is also in Google, so it may be limited in terms of its, um, 
in terms of its its uh, usefulness to those of you who don't have Google accounts, um, but hopefully it gives you something to start with, or you can at least share it, you know, with somebody who does have access to it. Um, but I will find that. There we go. Prompt library. Library. Let me share that. And let me grab the link and make sure that it's shared in an appropriate way. Yep. Anyone can access this. Now, this is a living and breathing document, okay? There is not a whole lot in it yet, um, but it's something, so I just put that link in the chat. Um, so hopefully those of you who have Google can can access this. Sorry for those of you who don't, I don't have a, a different version of this right now, but it does have some of the prompts that I use today um, and will be flushed out much, much more over the coming months. Um, and let me give you one other link actually, while I am, while I'm thinking about it. Um, this is a page that I maintain on the CSU Monterey Bay website. So I just put that second link into the chat right now. Um, there are a wealth of resources related to AI, including some training materials for those of you who are new to it. Um, so feel free to check that out in your own time if you're looking to build upon that knowledge. And Brandon, I don't know if you want to talk at all about, I know there's some efforts that you are making as an organization toward that, but I don't mean to totally put you on the spot, but I, I did. <laughs> It's fine if you're talking about just the development of courses and plant and materials around AI. So we are working on it at CBC at one. There's actually a ZTC in AI and open open education in AI that right. the group's developed under our umbrella within the main at one courses. We're looking into it. We know that there's a lot of demand for it, but as I was just telling Laura and Valerie before the webinar, those of us with experience in course development and design while some tools can speed up that process, it's not like we can just crank one out instantly because we do want to make sure that it's a quality course and that it meets the needs yes. of the system. Wonderful. So look forward to that. I think that's going to be wonderful. Um, anyone else? I know we only have five more minutes, so anyone else is welcome to share their experience, maybe something that worked well, or you can just jump in with any questions that you have for me in the last few minutes here. And you can put it into the chat. You can raise your hand. You can take yourself off mute. Is that you go? connection you gave us, is is that where we would go to for various and sundry AI resources? Um, the so the the most recent link in the chat is the um, is the survey. And then the one right above that is a CSU Monterey Bay um resource the there may be other ones available but that's just one that i have that i can freely give out that may be useful okay and the last one is for the for review we we give on the train yes thank you great well you you are welcome to go about your business everybody go eat something take a break it's been really lovely i'm i'm so grateful um to be invited to this this is really fun all right thank you so much laura just a couple things in closing so we're grateful for everyone that attended this webinar and giving laura your attention for the past hour and a half for some of us into your lunch break once again please look to the chat for the link to the survey that valerie posted you might have to scroll up just a little bit and the survey is again allow, set up to allow you to receive a copy of your responses, which can serve as a verification of your attendance. If you do need something beyond that, I'm going to type the email address that you can contact. It's support at cbc.edu. If for some reason the response link to the survey doesn't work, or if the verification from that isn't enough for your institution, please reach out to that email address. In addition, we hope that you register for some of the other webinars we'll be offering throughout the term. We are almost done with our spring series of webinar, but we do have another one about AI coming up pretty soon. Valerie did just post the link to that in the chat. And lastly, once again, this webinar and the associated slides will be available on that same website that Valerie posted. Just give us a week or so. 
thank you all. I'm going to stop the recording now and we can all go to grab lunch or get up and stretch or get some sunlight. Well, all right. <laughs> it, it, yeah. it,